Good afternoon, this is Jeff Kastman, and this is Welcome to Tradition, a series that my friend Jim DePiante and I are doing, covering topics that are of interest to people who are new to tradition. Maybe you've uh, just started coming to the traditional Latin Mass, and you're looking around and you're wondering what people do and why they do it, uh, or you've traveled a little bit and you may have seen some differences from one chapel to another. Uh, or perhaps you've been coming to the Mass for a very long time and you've always wondered why the priest does that thing or why people sit or stand or kneel or, or respond or don't respond when they do. And so we're covering those things. Jim, welcome this afternoon again. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. And uh, let's just briefly cover, I'm, uh, I've been coming to the traditional Latin Mass for about 21 years. Uh, I've been married for 27 years. I've got 14 children. And Jim, you have been a part of tradition your entire life. Would you just give us a, a brief recap of uh, your lifetime in tradition? Well, I, I only left when I had no alternative. Um, I was, I was uh, quite young and I just learned to serve mass, uh, serve the traditional mass when the 1965 missile was brought into our parish. And uh, my parents immediately understood that there was something wrong. And so we struggled to find a place to go to the traditional Latin mass, essentially through all of the 70s and into the, yeah, through all the 60s into the 70s. And then um, found some priests here in the Diocese of Charlotte, North Carolina, who were willing to say the traditional mass for us. Uh, first one, and then he died, and then another, and then he died. My parents concluded that that was a, that was a losing proposition because these old guys were just gonna keep dying. Uh, that was long before any new younger priests were interested. And it was around that time when, when they discovered the Society of St. Pius X and brought the society into North Carolina. And they and I have been a part of it. This was in 1980. And so we've essentially been a part of the uh, part of St. Anthony of Padua here in North Carolina since, since it, well, they were founding members since 1980. And Jim, one of the things that I really appreciate about your perspective on tradition is that although you attend a society chapel and you are naturally very fond of their apostolate and the work they do, and of course grateful for all that the uh, priests of the society have, have given to the people, the faithful over the last, in your case, 30 years, 40 years, uh, you recognize that the society is not some little church on its own, that the, the faithful and the priests are members of the Catholic Church. Uh, they're in union with the Holy Father. They want to be faithful Catholics. And you're constantly uh, in social media reminding people or, or perhaps just catechizing them. Catholic. Yeah, cate catechizing for the first time what it means to be Catholic and why they owe um, filial uh, love and obedience to, to the bishops of the church. Absolutely. To their own pastor, to their diocesan bishop, and to the Pope. And by the way, each of us should be praying for those three every day of our lives. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that quick background. Uh, so in, in our first few episodes, uh, just a brief recap as we always do, because I know people are, you know, you, you might come in on this episode for the first time. I want you to know what we've already covered so you can go back and check that. The first few episodes, we covered the basic principles for gestures and postures at mass and when to make those gestures, when, when to assume certain postures. And we went over the various levels of the solemnity of mass. So if, you, if you've seen low masses and sung masses and misa cantatas and high masses and all these different things and weren't really sure what the differences were, Jim's done a great job of explaining both the history and how the faithful should respond in those cases. Uh, Jim, would you briefly touch on that point, recap for us what those levels of solemnity are? Sure. So the most solemn, the Misa Solemnis Pontificalis, the solemn pontifical mass celebrated by a bishop. And that's really the mass as it's intended to be, but there aren't enough bishops to go around. And so we have the Misa Solemnis, it's very much the same, but the priest is the celebrant rather than a bishop. It's known simply as a solemn high mass in England, English. Uh, so Misa Solemnis Pontificalis and then Misa Solemnis. These solemn masses are sung and make use of um, sacred ministers, deacon and subdeacon to assist the celebrant at mass. But at its simplest, we have the Misa Lecta, formerly known as the Misa Privata. All parts are recited 
and it's commonly referred to as a low mass. Then what we experience most commonly is a Misa Cantata, that's something of a hybrid. It's a cross between the Misa Solemnis and the Misa Lecta, commonly known as the sung mass. Most parts are sung, but there are no sacred ministers. And as we do it now, it does include incense. And in our last episode, we uh, noted that the sung mass is not different from the solemn masses in terms of when to stand and sit and kneel. And we also observe that there's some differences with respect to the low mass. Uh, so for purposes of knowing when to stand, when to sit, when to kneel, we, you did a great job of narrowing down really two possibilities for the lady to consider a sung mass and a low mass. Right. And we began uh, that episode by describing the kind of the rationale behind the various postures. And I, I appreciate that because we want to teach people the principle so that they can then apply it properly in that situation. And so they can teach their children. That's extremely important. So uh, we talked about the, the rationale behind the, the various postures, standing, sitting, kneeling. Jim, would you go over that again, just briefly, because I continue to see questions uh, about this. And I, yeah, and I understand if you're, if you're new to all of this, we understand the confusion. So we might, we might laugh and joke, but that's because probably we get confused sometimes too. Go ahead, Jim. And uh, well, in, in fact, I, I paid particular attention at, uh, at, our, at our chapel on Sunday and I noticed that there, was, there is indeed some confusion. So the principle, standing is the primary liturgical posture. Standing is done for collective prayer. We literally stand together and pray together. Kneeling implies adoration and humility and it's personal. So it's for personal prayer, personal adoration, personal devotion, rather than collective. Sitting is essentially a passive posture for listening and reflection and meditation. And so it's fitting for the epistle, the sermon, longer chants, and whenever the priest sits, generally speaking. We also pointed out the interesting fact that sitting is rather a modern phenomenon. Historically, Catholics worshiped standing and then knelt for a very few parts of the mass, and that pews came into fashion with the Protestant revolution. Uh, the Protestant, in the Protestant theology, if we dare call it that, of worship is that the sermon is the central act of worship based on scripture, and they needed a place to sit for their long sermons. There are still, in the older, larger churches of Europe, you will not generally find pews. You might find some folding chairs set up, but you're not going to find row after row of wooden pews. Uh, and if you do find them in a church in Europe, they will definitely be either post-Protestant revolution construction or remodeling or added subsequently in these older churches. In the United States, all of our churches were built subsequent to the Protestant revolution, and so they all contain pews. It's very seldom that you go into a church here in the United States where you will not find pews. And Jim, we had a number of people responding to your comments about uh, the, the origin of the pews and, and the standing. Uh, wondering out loud, they were, I think, uh, if you had something against old people or pregnant women or people with back problems or knee problems, uh, do you really want those people coming to Mass to, to, to suffer through it? Um, certainly not. And, 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 and by the way, the idea that uh, this, this didn't start with Jim De Piante. Um, typically, in, in larger churches, there might be benches set up around the outside for people who were, um, who were infirm, uh, who needed to sit down. Um, nursing mothers, honestly, in bygone days, they probably wouldn't be at mass uh, until the, the child was, um, was old enough to, um, well, to not necessarily need to be at the breast. Uh, it's also true that in, in those days, younger children were often left at home for mass. So very different context. We live in a different world and pews don't seem all that unusual for us today. Yeah. And uh, I promise you all of our listeners that Jim just touched on a sensitive subject, children at mass. We will get to that very important topic, but 
Uh, not quite yet. So not today. <laughs> yeah. oh, hold your breath. Okay. Uh, so we've then went through what to do and when to do it during the Misa Cantata, uh, that, that is the sung mass, and, and got as far as the preface. Can we pick up there? Sure enough. So just before the preface, we've been sitting through the entire offertory. You stand when this, the thurifer, the, the altar server carrying the thurible, the thing that contains the burning incense, when he approaches for the incensation of the people, he will bow, you return his bow, you will be incensed, and then he will bow again, and then you return his bow, and you remain standing through the preface. Next up, the Sanctus. All right, and, and this, uh, for people who are kind of pay attention to liturgy and, and or people who've traveled, it seems that this, the Sanctus is kind of the most controversial part of the Mass. Stand, sit, or kneel? Stand. There should be no controversy. This is an act of collective worship. The faithful in the congregation are singing together, worshiping together, and so there's no question. You should, you should stand and sing until you've sung through the conclusion of the Benedictus. Then you kneel. And yet, uh, there are those who insist on kneeling at the Sanctus bell, and yeah, uh, they're they're wrong. <laughs> there's no other way to put it. There's there's a general but mistaken understanding that the Sanctus bell means kneel down. Um, the Sanctus bell rather is a signal that something important is about to happen. In fact, pretty much every time the bell rings, it is it is to indicate what is coming up next. So the confusion is due to the fact that you do kneel. Immediately upon hearing the Sanctus bell, you kneel at a low mass, but that's because you're not participating in singing the Sanctus. The priest is reciting the Sanctus. It is now no longer an act of collective worship. And so you kneel down and you say the Sanctus to yourself, but that's private. And so you do it kneeling. Um, oh, as you conclude the Sanctus, uh, Benedictus qui venit in nomine domini, you make the sign of the cross, then kneel for private adoration, remain kneeling. While you're kneeling, just after the consecration, you can bow your head as the priest genuflects at the elevation. The right thing to do is to look at the host, adore the blessed sacrament, and say, my Lord and my God. Then bow again at the priest genuflection. You do the same thing for the cons after the consecration of the chalice, you can bow as the priest genuflects at the elevation. You adore the precious blood. You should look at it and adore it. And then after, when the priest genuflects, you can bow again. So continuing, uh, do not strike your breast when the priest says, nobis quoque pegadoribus. That's his to say and his to strike his breast for it, not you. Still kneeling throughout. Um, you then rise when you hear the priest sing, per omnia secula seculorum. And you continue to stand through the Pater Noster, through the Our Father, and remain standing. Again, we come to a point of controversy. Remain standing through the Agnus Dei, because that's an act of collective worship. You're singing together. Strike your breast three times, miserere nobis, miserere nobis, dona nobis pacem, then kneel. Jim, in my uh, growth in the study of the faith and understanding of the, of the reasons behind what we believe and what we do. One of the things that's been helpful for me is to understand a hierarchy of virtues. Uh, for example, we, uh, one of the common problems we see in the, in the modern church is a disordered kind of obedience. Uh, uh, people who believe that obedience is, is the greatest of the virtues and all other virtues uh, serve obedience. We, we know that that's not the case. Within the context of this conversation that we're having, thinking back to the sin of singularity and the importance of unity within liturgical worship. I've just heard what you said about when to stand and when to kneel at the Sanctus bell, but what happens when I'm there standing and the first four or five pews, they all kneel down and then people look around and then all of a sudden they kneel down and then pretty soon the whole chapel is kneeling except for me. And you're, and you're standing there doing the right thing and looking a lot like a dope. Yeah. So how do we how do we understand the the the, the virtues in this regard in terms of 
you know, modesty is part of it, doing the right thing at the right time. But, you know, there's some humility, right? We don't want to stand out and make a scene of ourselves and, and we want to support unity. How, how do we reconcile those issues in these uh, kind of awkward moments? There, there's no question. If you're the only one standing, kneel down. So there's, there's the immediate problem to deal with. The immediate problem is, what do I do right this minute? And, and we're about ready to have the consecration. And, and, and I, need, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be singular. And so we solve that problem because there's no sin in it. There's no wrong in it. And so you kneel down so as not to stand out. But the problem eventually needs to be solved for the long term. And that's really up to the priest to do. And I know that certainly society priests, FSSP priests, and uh, Institute of Christ the King priests, I'm sure they all know that the fitting thing to do during the Sung Sanctus is to remain standing during the Sung on You Stay. The, the better thing to do is to remain standing. They will absolutely cooperate. Remember, they're not, they don't see you. They're, they're, they're facing what they're, they're going about their business. They have, they don't know what's going on behind them. Don't hesitate to tell them and say, listen, father, I think a word from you, just a word, maybe something in the bulletin might help us do this with a certain unity that bespeaks the unity of the Christian faithful. And so in the short term, don't stand out in the long term, work with your priest to solve the problem, to do the better thing. So in, in theological or philosophical terms, we have the proximate problem of... <laughs> well, uh, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, becoming a spectacle, right? And, 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 and the need for unity, uh, that's an opportunity for us to grow in humility. And, and then we have the ultimate problem of catechesis, the people don't know what to do. And, and that's, you and I are trying to help out with catechesis, but ultimately that problem really falls on, on the pastor or the or the priest who's in charge to, to decide how to correct that problem. How to deal with that. In, so in the meantime, they can watch, they can watch these podcasts and, and they'll know exactly what's right. Yeah. But it, it, it's not, you know, sometimes Catholics are so zealous about these things, probably young men in particular, that they, they might want to look around and kind of point to people and, and, or afterwards offer correction, but that's, that's really not their. That's not, that's not the best approach. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. So soon after this, uh, but before the priest receives communion, before he makes his, his own communion, he says, Domini non sum dignus three times. Uh, do the faithful strike their breasts when they hear him saying those words or when they see him making those gestures? That's a no. He will, you don't. However, soon after, the confitior, especially within the precincts of the Society of St. Pius X, the confitior will again be recited by the servers. And so you follow the same procedure that you'd followed for the confitior earlier in the Mass. You bow slightly, strike your breast three times at the male culpa, then after, when the priest begins the indulgentium absolutionem, you kneel erect and make the sign of the cross as you kneel erect. Then the priest will turn around with the blessed sacrament. He'll hold up a single host over the ciborium. Your job at that point is to adore the blessed sacrament and strike your breast three times as he now says, domine non sum dignus. So three times at the domine non sum dignus. And we, we touched on this briefly, but uh, every time I go to Mass, I'm reminded of it. How hard do I hit my chest? You don't. You don't hit it. You touch it. <laughs> if you can hear it, it's too hard. And by the way, the closed fist isn't the point. It's a liturgical gesture. And so it's done with a certain delicacy. So hand like so, as always. Okay. The other hand on the sternum, just below the sternum. And then you just touch your breast. So, domine non sum dignus, domine non sum dignus, domine non sum dignus. That's all. It's a gesture. And we've had some parents uh, contact us about this. They're holding a baby or they're holding two babies, right? They're not, they're not sinning if they, if they can't, uh, you know, comply at the proper time, right? Any other comments you want to make about about moms and dads with babies and all sorts of... You know, the, the point of it all is to, is to render homage to our God. Um, I have sometimes a dozen guys standing back in my little tiny choir space. And um, we learned very quickly that, for example, at the last blessing, don't kneel. 
because we're going to kick over chairs. We're going to bump into each other. We're going to make a great cacophony back there. And so I tell the guys, look, it's fitting. It's fitting to bow. So if you got a baby in one hand, a missile in another, and you can't strike your breasts, it's fitting. Just head bow. A head bow is a marvelous gesture. <laughs> you can pretty much do that at any time. So that's the answer. Do, do minimally what you can do. Right. Okay, now it's time to go to communion. Uh, this is another opportunity where we see a, a clash of cultures, people who've grown up. Oh my up. goodness. People who've grown up in the Novus Ordo or, or people who've been away from the, the faith for a long time or they're, or they're converts from a, a non-Catholic religion. And, um, you know, you see all sorts of things going on. You don't know what's right. You want to do the right thing. Help us out here. What kind of special guidance would you offer to people at this point in the liturgy? Sure enough, first and foremost, if you're not going to receive communion, stay in your place. Now, I know that can be awkward. Um, if, if you want to hide the fact that you can't go to communion, either because you ate food just before mass or you have some other reason to not go to communion, uh, and you feel like you need to approach the altar, fine. But that, that, should, that should be the exception, never the rule. Uh, in any case, when you do go to the communion rail, rise when it's time for your row to go. You don't just make a mad dash for the communion rail. Follow the others from your pew into the center aisle. You do not genuflect when you leave your pew. You do not genuflect at any time when you're receiving communion. It's fitting to go with your hands folded if you can. If you got a baby in one hand, it's fitting to put your other hand on your breast. The idea is to assume a reverent posture as you walk to the communion rail, the most important thing that you can do as a Christian is about to happen in the daily life of a Christian, you're going to receive your God in communion. That is the time to assume a very reverent posture. Um, go to the rail when you can. It's rare that you see them now, but there may be a cloth over the communion rail, sometimes called the communion cloth. Uh, also known more formally as either a domenical, a manutergium, or, and I love this, it's a British term, a houseling cloth. So if you have one of those, it's unmistakable. It's usually put out immediately before communion, or it might be held by the servers. Just place your hands under the cloth. You do not raise it up. You do not fool with it. You just put your hands under it. That's to keep your hands out of the way. If you don't have that, it's fine to fold your hands, but what you don't want to do is absolutely don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. You need to leave space here for the server to put the patten under your chin. Uh, if you have them where they interfere with the patten, a diligent server will help you understand that you can't put them there. <laughs> Sometimes they'll give you a little bit of a, a little stiff smack, maybe stiffer than it needs to be. Um, but they'll try to work around you, but don't make it hard for them. Uh, traditionally, in the Latin church, uh, we were taught to cross our arms across our breast, like so. This is, this is absolutely the requirement in the Eastern church, okay? So, like so, to receive communion. Now, here's where we run into problems, and my sons serve. Uh, they've, they've, mentioned this. Other servers I know have mentioned this. People who know the Novus Ordo, they've received communion in the past with outstretched hands. It's also, it happens that in the Novus Ordo, people will go up to whoever is distributing communion for a blessing. Now, that's not supposed to happen. Remember, if you're not going to receive communion, don't go to the communion room. You don't go just for blessing. But in the Novus Ordo, they do that. And how do they indicate to the priest that they want a blessing and not communion? Well, if this is how you receive communion, this is what they do to say they're not going to receive communion. But in the Latin church and in the Eastern church, this is a very clear signal that you know you're about to receive communion. It's very confusing for the priest. It's very confusing for the altar servers. So uh, if, you're, if you're new to all of this, if you're not receiving communion, don't go up. And those people don't need to feel left out, right? Because there is a blessing specifically for those people in the liturgy, right? 
Sure enough. I mean, the blessing at the end of mass is specifically for those people as well. And um, considerations of, of being a state of mortal sin aside, the first thing you want to do, well, let, let's, let's address it. The first thing you want to do is make an act of contrition that, that articulates why you're making the act of contrition for the love of God. Let God sort what out how perfect your contrition is, then make a spiritual communion. Uh, now, when the priest, oh, interesting note, servers don't have the option to stay in their pew when it comes time for communion because they're all assembled across the foot on the, on the first step of the predella. And they're all there and maybe they had a cheeseburger immediately before mass. <laughs> and so their little clue that they're not going to receive communion, they'll take the patent from the person to their right, and put a finger over their lips and pass the patent to the next guy. And so the master of ceremonies and the priest know that they're not going to receive communion. A layman should never be doing that, except in the rare instance where you knowingly would go to the altar for communion, even though you shouldn't receive communion. When the priest approaches, head goes back, tongue goes out. You do not say amen, amen, or anything else after you receive communion. Uh, be very careful to draw it back into your mouth without letting it fall out. Uh, you do not chew the host. You let it dissolve within your mouth. You rise, you return to your place using the side aisle. When you get back, it was customary, but you very rarely see this now. It was totally customary for people to recollect themselves in a posture with their hand, their face in the palm of their hands so that they could make their, their very private thanksgiving, then get out their missile and read the various prayers said after communion. Now, strictly speaking, in this time, after you've received communion, whether you've received or not, until uh, and th through the ablutions, you can sit. You have, even if you haven't gone to communion, if you have, you have our Lord within you and he's going to be there, the church tells us, for 10 to 15 minutes. The person to your right, the person to your left are like a tabernacle at that moment. They contain the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Father's up on the altar distributing communion. Why would you want to sit down? So you can whether or not you should, uh, we'll leave that to your conscience. All right, we're almost done. I, I know that we're going to have some issues about uh, communion and chewing and all the rest of it, but I want to get through this part and we can deal with that on, as the questions come in. Uh, what is our clue about when to stand after communion, after most people have been kneeling? What's the clue? So after the ablutions, after Father cleans the Saborium and Chalice, he'll go to the Missal on his right to recite the communion antiphon, which the Scola will already have sung. He will then come to the center, turn and face the people and chant Dominus Fobiscum et cum Spiritu Tuo. He'll then return to the Missal. You remain standing or so, yes, at the Dominus Fobiscum, you rise. Father goes back to the missal. You remain standing through the post-communion. Bow your head when he says, Jesus Christum, which he always will. Uh, he returns to the center. You remain standing for the Ite Misa Est. You kneel for the last blessing. You stand immediately after the blessing. Father will go over to the, to the gospel side to recite the last gospel. You sign yourself again on the forehead, on the lips, and on the heart. You genuflect that et verbum caro factum est. You remain standing for the recessional hymn. After the recessional hymn, you kneel for private prayers of thanksgiving. You genuflect as you exit the pew. You don't walk backwards out the door. You don't genuflect again as you get to the door. You make one last sign of the cross as you dip your hands in what is referred to as the stoop and take, and I love this term, the lustral water, which is what it's actually called, and you bless yourself one last time. Done. We're almost done. There's one last thing. It's customary. It's not prescribed. And it's not customary everywhere, but it's something you can do, and it's very beautiful. If you've received communion before consuming any other food or beverages, and before breaking your fast, you take a drink of water. Beautiful custom. I, I, I love that. Um, okay, so this is for the sung mass. Right. What's different in a low mass? Very little. First, there's no asperges. So you simply stand for the procession to the altar. Uh, you stand for the processional hymn, if there is one. You kneel 
Father will not kneel and start the prayers at the foot of the altar until the processional hymn is done. You kneel when he kneels. This is all now private because you're not engaged in, in collective worship with your fellows. All the same gestures throughout the prayers at the foot until Father ascends to the altar. Now things start to get different. You remain kneeling for the introit, the collect, the epistle, the proper is gradual, alleluia, tract, and sequence. Now, oh, don't some people sit at the epistle? They do, and they're not wrong. So wherever you go, you do what all of the others do. Don't be singular. And we have the same problem. If half the congregation is sitting and the other half is kneeling, you might just mention to Father, hey, it really doesn't matter what we do, but can you get us on the same page? Then, as at the sung mass, uh, you stand for the for the gospel in Latin. Uh, you sit for the epistle. You stand again for the, for the epistle in English. You stand for the gospel in English. You sit for the sermon, all as at the uh, sung mass. And as usual, you stand for the credo. But since the credo is not sung, now you do in fact kneel at, at incarnatus est. Then, after the credo, Father will turn around, say Dominus Fobiscum, uh, before the offertory begins. You remain seated throughout the offertory. You stand at the Dominus Fobiscum before the preface. Some places kneel throughout, do what the other folks are doing. Then you kneel immediately at the Sanctus bell. Uh, and this is what's behind the confusion, as we mentioned, at the sung mass. Communion, same as the sung mass. You don't stand for the post-communion, typically. You, so you remain kneeling. After communion, you remain kneeling throughout. You don't stand for the post-communion. You don't stand for the Ite Misa S, obviously. Uh, you, you stay kneeling all the way through the blessing until the last gospel. The last gospel is the same. You rise at the Dominus Fobiscum before the last gospel. You genuflect that et incarnatus est. And then you, after mass, you kneel for the Leonine prayers the prayers which were instituted by Pope Leo, hence the name Leonine Prayers. You do not strike your breast at O Clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary and the Hail Holy Queen. You do, however, at the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, strike your breast, most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us, most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Then you stand and conclude as at a sung mass. If there's a, a recessional hymn, you would stand for that. Uh, is it possible that all of these things that we've just been talking about, the very specific uh, guidance that you've given us, can it in fact vary from one place to the next? It does. Often enough in a, in a place that has uh, low mass during the week, essentially people kneel at the beginning and kneel uh, until the gospel. They rise for the gospel. They kneel again. There's often no sermon. They kneel through the offertory. They remain kneeling through the communion, uh, through the consecration, through the communion, and only rise again for the last gospel. And, and that's that. So essentially, kneel start to finish, rise for the two gospels. And that is that. Do what everybody else is doing unless it's absolutely wrong. At a low mass, there's not much that's absolutely wrong. Uh, by the way, low mass varies much more than sung mass. A lot of local customs. Okay, finally, Jim, you said that there's one minor difference in a pontifical mass, whether it's long or, or so, uh, sung or solemn. What is that difference? So when a priest gives the last blessing at the end of the mass, he's the, he says the placeat tibi, and it concludes with per Christum Dominum Nostrum. So he'll, he'll sing per Christum Dominum Nostrum, you respond, amen. Or he'll say it in a, uh, in a low mass. He then, still facing the altar, says, benedicat vos, omnipotens deus. He'll turn to the faithful and give the blessing. And so he will say, pater et filius et spiritus sanctus. One, two, three. You simply make the sign of the cross. And that's that. When a bishop gives the last blessing, a priest bishop, or a priest blessing, I mean, it's real, it's very real, but he only gives it as an extension of the orders of the bishop, of the bishop's holy orders. When the bishop gives a blessing, 
That's the whole deal. So after he says, Placiat TV, concluding with Per Christum Dominum Nostrum, you, you respond, Amen. Still facing the altar, he says, Sit nomen Domini Benedictum. Ex hoc nunc et usque in seculum is your response. He says, Sit nomen Domini Benedictum. You respond, ex hoc nunc et usque in seculum. Then he says, aditorium nostrum in nomine domini, standard answer, qui fecit celum et terram. Then he says, benedicat vos omnipotens, omnipotens Deus. He turns around to the faithful and he gives the blessing, but now you get the whole deal. And so he says, pater et filius et spiritus sanctus. Whenever Bishop gives a blessing, he begins with that. Sit nomen Domini Benedictum, ex hoc nunc et usque in seculum, auditorium nostrum in nomine Domini, qui fecit celum et terram, benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, and then three blessings. The Episcopal blessing, pater, et filius, et spiritus sanctus, everything after that concludes just as at a sung mass, and there you have it. Jim, thank you for another great episode, covered lots of great stuff uh, today. And I, I'm looking forward at the outline that we have been putting together based- uh, What are we gonna do next? <laughs> yeah, based in, based in large part on what people have been asking and, and questions and suggestions, as well as what you and I are, are seeing and hearing in our uh, local masses and the, the questions that I get from my children uh, as well. Uh, so thank you again for being here and, and giving us uh, so generously of your time. Uh, My pleasure and likewise. Folks, I hope you have uh, enjoyed this episode. Please uh, like it, subscribe, uh, share it with your friends and continue to send us your, your questions and ideas for future topics. Thanks again, Jim. Thank you all. God bless you, Jeff. God bless you, everyone.